we'll turn the time over to Reed. He's uh, a beekeeper. Um, he's done a, a lot more than I have. And so he's got some really good experience to, to kind of share with us. Go ahead, Reed. So anyhow, beekeeping. Let's just go over some of this. We probably won't get through the whole presentation that I sent to Lena, but uh, we'll get through the, the most important parts here. Um, some of the things that we'll be going over, we'll talk a little bit about history and then how they're, why they're so important as pollinators. Then we've got to go through things like bee biology, morphology and physiology to kind of understand the animal itself. And then we'll go into the nuts and bolts of the equipment, um, feeding them, you know, installing a hive if we get time like that. And that's kind of the, how we're going to talk. Um, bees have, have been around for eons. And sorry, they, they evolved from wasps. They're in that same Hymenoptera order. And, um, you know, if you go back through the fossil record, um, the, the bees that are found, the honey bees that are found in amber, which are, you know, you know, very, very old and very, very ancient, are anatomically similar, very anatomically similar to the bees we have today. So they, they haven't evolved much, which means they're really adapted for this planet, for life on this planet, which is true of most insects. But if you think about it, bees and ants have been around for a long, long time. The oldest honeybee fossil is 35 million years. And they, they originated, you know, where a lot of our um, crops originated um, in, in um, Asia, Southeast Asia. And if you think about it, that's where alfalfa came from. That's where apples came from. Um, and so a lot of our crops and a lot of the things that we use, including honeybees, came from that area. Um, anyhow, this is a 40 million year old bee caught in amber, that picture right there. There's 20,000 different kind of bees today, 4,000 just in the United States and, and about 7,000 different types in, in South America and then thousands of other in other places. The smallest is very, very teeny tiny bee. And the largest, like these Madagascar giant honeybees, are almost two inches big. So very diverse group. Um, there's three basic subgroups, though, you can put them in. And it's the giant honeybees, which, um, you know, are in more tropical areas and have their honeycomb outside the nest. And then there's dwarf honeybees, really, really small bees, and other kind of non-stinging type bees, and some of those are in South America. Um, they produce really, really great honey, but not very much of it. Um, and don't be, don't, don't buy, don't be, um, um, you know, thinking, hey, let's get some stingless honeybees, because some of these dwarf honeybees that are stingless, um, the way that they protect themselves is to fly in your eyes and nose and mouth. I mean, they really go for the nose and have been known to kill horses that way. So um, don't go looking for stingless honeybees. They're, they have a more insidious way of protecting themselves almost. And then there's the ones that we use for, for honey called the European honeybees. Now remember, it's not just bees that produce wax and honey. Um, ants and wasps also do this. And all insects, for, the, for that matter, produce wax. If you take woolly aphids, for instance, that, that woolly white stuff, that's just wax that they've got all over their bodies to protect themselves with. And so many insects do some of these same things. It's just that honeybees, they produce a wax comb you can cut. And then they also, um, the honey that they produce, they store it separately from the pollen and other things that they're, that they're all, that other insects, um, you know, produce also. So, and yeah, mostly what we're going to talk about is uh, Apis mellifera, and that originated in India or Southeast Asia, um, and they spread to Europe and Africa, so that's one of the reasons why they're called the European honeybee, because, um, you know, they eventually came, you know, they eventually really had really, really good beekeeping in, in Europe. That's where beekeeping really took off. Um, and then they came to the Americas with the Spanish settlers in the 16th century. Um, a lot of the of the of the native native population in the Americas called honeybees, European honeybees. They called them white white man's flies because uh, they usually spread ahead of the European colonists. Um, 
Now, and then there's the stingless honeybees that I mentioned there. And they were very important for, for the Mayan culture. The Mayan culture keep the, kept these bees in logs and um, it was really important for their, um, for their way of life. It's been going on, beekeeping and, and, and especially gathering honey has been going on for a, a long time. This is um, a rock art that depicts the gathering of honey, um, 6,000 BC. Um, and some of the earliest forms of, of beekeeping itself, not just gathering, you know, hunter-gatherer types that were gathering it from natural bee colonies, but actually keeping honeybees were, were the Egyptians. And it actually, actually, the honeybee was one of the symbols that represented lower Egypt. And there's a hieroglyph of them taking honey out of their clay, clay pots. Um, of course, when the Greeks came through, especially Alexander the Great, they, um, they, uh, that's when they got involved in beekeeping and brought that back to, to the Greeks, eventually to the Romans, and then later on to the, to the Britons. Alexander the Great, one of the stories about him is that in order to preserve his body, they put him in a vat of honey, which is very antimicrobial and, and very preservative and kept his body um, for, for quite a while before internment in the honey. Now, that's an important concept because honey and propolis, which is, a, which is um, another product that the honeybees produce, um, are very, very, have great medicinal purposes for keeping um, bacteria and, and fungi at bay. That's why inside the honey hot, the beehive, it's very, very clean, very, very cleanly. And the bees do not ever defecate unless they're very sick inside the hive. So inside the hive, that's very clean. In fact, in Europe, I've been told that um, the bandages have so, are impregnated with honey and propolis in order to reduce um, the bacteria and and things that would otherwise invade wounds and things. But anyhow, the Britons eventually um, started out um, with the honeybees and became very, very adept at it. And actually during the dark ages, so to speak, if there was such a thing as the dark ages, <laughs> but during the dark ages, um, the, the Britons kept the bee um, technology going. And in fact, the Britons were kind of referred to as the, as the honeybee islands, the British Isles. Okay. But also during the same time in 2000 BC, India and even Mayans um, kept honeybees and the Mayans at least a thousand years ago. So the, the way that we used to keep bees was in, were in wicker skeps. And each one of those different coils was called an eek. And that's where we get that term to eek out a living. It comes from, it comes from beekeepers. But that was hard to keep bees in because you couldn't um, get the honey out or check the bees without cutting through the comb and, and destroying a lot of the work that the bees have put, put together. And it was hard to medicate them. It was, hard, it was almost impossible to find the queen bee. You couldn't study the queen at the time because it was so hard to find her in that skep because they had bird comb that whole thing up and you really couldn't get through it. And so they start, first started inverting the baskets and having comb hives from little sticks that were laid across the top of the comb. But then during the Civil War, there was a, 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 Catholic, a Catholic priest by the name of Lorenzo Langstroth that really studied bees. And you might wonder why is a Catholic studying bees there? Well, it's because they needed um, you know, candles for their, for their um, ceremonies and for the chapels and, and for masses. And so they felt like it was very, very important to use beeswax because at the time we didn't totally understand bee reproduction. We felt like the, the, the queen had immaculate conception. And so the, the wax would be, would be clean and pure. And so we needed to use beeswax for a lot of those ceremonies. So a lot of the, the priests would keep bees. And they, a lot of the priests were studying bees. And one of those was Lorenzo. And he found out that bees would not produce burr comb or, or propolize spaces that were a quarter of an inch to a three-eighths of an inch wide. And that was very important to the development of beekeeping because we found out that instead of using these skep hives, we could start using 
we can start using wooden boxes and then the frames that go inside those wooden boxes maintain that B space, a quarter of an inch to three, eight inches. And you'll notice if you do beekeeping, you leave one of those frames out accidentally, they'll immediately propolize that or put burr comb in it. And so you want to definitely make sure that you only have bee space in the hives. And that's what those square boxes do, is they maintain that, that space. And that way you can pull out the individual frames, look at the bees, look at the brood for disease, find the queen, um, and then also look at the eggs and see the egg laying patterns to determine how well the, the bee colony is and how healthy it is. So that was called the Langstroth hive. Bees are really important for pollination. Um, you know, 80% of the crops that are buzz pollinated are done by bees. Uh, and 8% and of the pollinisa pollinization is done through buzz pollinization. For instance, blueberries, cranberries, anything, especially tomatoes in our area, they need to have that bee get in there and buzz, which means the bee gets in there and flexes its thorax and its wings flutter very, very rapidly. And it causes a bit of a pollen explosion. And then the bees take and comb that pollen into their pollen baskets. And, and, and of course, feed some of the pollen to their brood. Um, they mix it with honey and make bee bread. But they also, as they fly from flower to flower, they take the pollen. Another reason why honeybees are so good at pollinization is because they don't randomly fly from flower to flower to flower. They'll go for a week on one certain type of flower and then switch over as the nectar um, reward changes, they'll switch over to another species, but they'll stay pretty um, devoted to that species, which is great because they keep on bringing pollen from one flower to another as they, as they stay devoted to that certain crop at, at the time. Um, so pollination, it increases both yields and quality. If you think about your, your tomato, um, to, in order to get a red juicy tomato, you've got to realize that that right there, that tomato is a fruit or an ovary. And in order for that ovary to get red and juicy, it needs to be fertile. Anytime you, you fertilize, anytime a flower gets pollinated and then the gametes come together in fertilization, that becomes a sink in the environment, a sink for nutrients, a sink for water, and a sink for hormones. Everything starts flowing to that little floret that was pollinized. Without the pollinization, the, the, the apple or the, um, the nut, the, the, um, you know, the, um, or the, or the fruit doesn't become a sink. And so you'll get fruits, but they won't be very um, juicy. They won't be large. They won't be highly productive because they haven't become a sink. And if you think about tomatoes, for instance, they have a whole bunch of seeds in there and all of those seeds need to be pollinated. And that's where buzz pollination comes in for some of these crops, it's very important. So the almond industry depends on honeybees to do their beekeeping because even though you'll get almonds without bees, you won't get really big, great almonds. Alfalfa on the other hand, <laughs> It likes to be pollinated, but it doesn't like to be pollinated by bees because bees tend to get whacked by the floret once they trip it. And they would rather be pollinated by uh, another type of bee, blue mason bees or, or um, other type of bees that come in from the bottom to pollinate them. So different types of crop needs different types of pollination. The other great thing about bees being a pollinator is they, they overwinter. And that means that you can bring your honeybees from Idaho and Montana and take them to California and have the bee pollinies be 60,000 bees per colony strong in order to really get out there and pollinate. Now, you can pollinate them with, with wasps and, I mean, you can, you can pollinate almonds with wasps and, you know, moths and things like that, but it takes a long time for the wasp population or the moth population to grow. And by the time you've built up a big enough population, the florets have always already fallen to the ground. Whereas you can take bees that have a pre-bumped up pollen, uh, um, population and take them right out there. You know, that queen is, is laying about a thousand eggs per day when they take her out there to help do that pollination. So they've got plenty of fertility in those hives in order to really do the pollination well. Um, so 
Uh, and they'll also forage for around five miles and they'll take eight to four to eight flights a day. Now here's something that's really crazy. It takes a lot of flights and a lot of flight miles to produce a 16 ounce jar of honey. <laughs> Got a flight of the moon and back to produce that honey. So anyhow, bees are really, really hard workers and get a lot done for us. Any questions now before we go into like bee biology, anatomy, physiology, things like that? Any questions? Okay, great. And, and everybody's hearing me, right? I've been talking a long time. I hope I haven't blinked off or anything. Yeah, you're still with us. Okay. <laughs> yep, we can hear you. <laughs> Makes me nervous sometimes. Anyhow, let's talk about their anatomy. Um, the, the cats are the worker and the queen, of course, and the drones. And then we'll talk about the behavior a little bit, some of their diseases and pests here. Here is the bee anatomy. And I, I know that doesn't look quite like a bee, but you know, have you ever seen sheep that have just been sheared? They don't look like sheep either. So yeah, this is a bee with all of its fur um, shaved off so that we can see its anatomy. And we can see there's certain things that are different about bees than there are with mammals. First of all, where they breathe from. They don't have a nose in their face. They have those spiracles along the abdomen. And so they'll imbibe, they'll suck in air, kind of like an accordion. If you've ever looked at a bee on a flower, their, their um, abdomen is just going in and out like an accordion. And that's so they can bring in the air. Now the air doesn't go into lungs. It goes right straight into, um, into these, um, through the spiracles, in through, um, some tubes called trachea. And those tubes keep on bifurcating until it gets down to the cellular, cellular level, which means there's no interface between the air and the cells. Like we have lungs that can kind of um, keep out some of the dust and the pollen and the, and the dirt and the disease and even pesticides and insecticides. Bees don't. For instance, you can just splash um, soapy water on bees and that'll kill them because that soapy water will do two things. One, it'll get right into the spiracles. And second of all, it'll disrupt that, the bee's exoskeleton, which is covered with wax. And it'll strip the wax off their exoskeleton and desiccate them quite rapidly. Same thing with wasps. If you've noticed, wasp spray kills wasps immediately. And that's because their anatomy and physiology is way, way different than ours, way different, okay? And then they've got those, legs there. This is the anatomy of a worker. She's got a pollen press there on her hind legs and she's got little combs that you can't see on there, but she's got these combs that she can use to rub all over her body. And well, you can see the antenna clear, cleaner on that second leg there. And she uses that to clean the pollen off her antennae. Okay. And remember, she uses her antennae for her sense of smell. And it's not the same type of sense that we've got. She's smelling for mates, so she's smelling for pheromones, and she's smelling for those, those um, floret um, cues um, and things. And they smell the world differently than we smell it. So they can bring back a smell into the hive and do a dance and everybody will get the idea that that smell is coming from the place where we want to go and, and gather nectar. And then they'll go out in the environment and follow that smell until they get the nectar. Okay. Well, let's go back to stings here for a minute. If you're gonna be a, a beekeeper, you're, you're gonna have to get used to stings. I'll just kind of mention this. Um, the worst case scenario is if you try to totally protect yourself from bee stings, because invariably you'll get stung once every single year. Now, if you get stung once every single year, your body can't build up uh, the right types of immunity to it. And by the third sting on the third year, you'll, you'll get stung in the neck and it'll blow your head up like a popsicle and you'll go into the hospital with anaphylactic, or you could, I shouldn't say you will, you could go into the hospital with anaphylactic shock like my grandpa did. Well, we learned our lesson and we stopped using gloves. We kept the nets for our face because we didn't like getting stung. To, you know, if you get stung right there in the middle of the nose, that hurts. And so we always used the nets, but we allowed ourselves to get stung every single time, every time we worked with the bees, you know, and then you build up an immunity with it and you end up, you know, bee stings get, to, they always hurt. I'm not saying that, that you get used to the sting, but um, you get to where you can um, put up with the, um, your body puts up with the shock from, of the, um, the poisons and stuff. 
So I guess one of my big things, if you're going to be a beekeeper, um, you're going to have a difficult time protecting yourself from every single bee sting. And if you do, you're actually um, putting yourself at more risk that way, in my opinion. Okay. Here's their mouth parts. Um, of course, when they're larvae, they have, they have different types of mouth parts, but the adult mouth parts are for lapping and sucking. And they don't have a straw necessarily, a round straw. It's that they take all these three different uh, modified papillae and put them together and form a straw that they can go ahead and suck up through, okay? And um, that's how they get their, um, that's how they get their um, nectar up through their mouth. Um, some of the uh, anatomy here of, of the bee is, is important there. Um, it doesn't show the trachea in this, but if we ever want to dissect bee, oh, it does show the air sacs up there at the top of the thorax there. Um, if you ever cut into the thorax, you will notice that it is completely beautifully white. And it looks a lot like really, really expensive crab meat. And in actually, it's not that much different than expensive crab meat. Um, these are these are kind of related to crustaceans. They're they're not crustaceans, but um, they do have an exoskeleton, and so they're more related to crustaceans than we are. But anyhow, they're completely full of musculature, and that's what why what, what's so important about the bees. The most important thing about them is their musculature and their air sacs. If you do anything to compromise their muscles or their air sacs, then they can't go out and forage for for honey. And some of the main things that compromise them would be fungi and bacteria that invade those air sacs or diseases that, that cause them to be weaker in their, in their musculature. Or mites, mites that, that um, actually um, can crawl in through the, the um, spiracles and get into those trachea. And they tend to get into the trachea that are larger in the thorax and plug up the trachea. And so you gotta be really careful with that. Okay, so they suck up the honey and they put it into a honey stomach and they add enzymes to it. And then they regurgitate it out and, and manipulate it in their mouth parts until it dries out. And they keep um, swallowing it and regurgitate it over and over again until it gets dry. And the enzymes have had a chance to turn it from, you know, just regular um, sugars, nectar into hot honey. And honey is not nectar. Nectar will not be, will not store and will get fungi and bacteria in it really, really rapidly and decay. Whereas honey is very, very antimicrobial, very, very dry. It's only about 14% moisture, which is a lot like an, a bale of alfalfa hay. Alfalfa hay is about, you know, 14, 15% moisture. So it's extremely dry. So if fungi and bacteria land on honey, they Im immediately explode because of the osmotic pressures that are involved. And, there, and honey is extremely acidic. And that also causes um, death to the, any pathogens. So we can store honey for a long time. Now it'll crystallize, but if you put it back on the oven and slowly heat it in water, in a glass jar in water, you can reconstitute it and it'll be preserved for, for many, many years. In fact, it's one of the, of, of the crops that's the most, um, easy to sell because it, it, it's, it, you stand a lot less chance harming people from selling honey than selling tomatoes or corn or any other type of crop that may be contaminated. Okay. Now there's three different casts. There's workers, which are the, which are the females. And these females, the workers are, are, um, are a recombination of the genetic material from the parents. So the male and the female gametes have to come together to produce a worker. So whenever you have an egg that is fertilized, it is going to be a worker bee or a female bee. Now, oh, but that female bee also could become a queen. So any of the eggs that are fertilized are gonna be females and if they don't get fed royal jelly, they will become workers. And if they get fed royal jelly, they will become a queen. 
Now, royal jelly is produced by young female workers from a mandibular gland that they produce. And they produce this um, royal jelly, which is very, very nutritious. But it causes a genetic changes in that female bee, in that female larva. And the younger the female larva is, the more the changes will be apparent. And as the female larva gets older and older and older, you'll get less and less queeniness of the, of the larva. So that when the, if, you, if the colony wants to produce a new queen, then they'll feed larvae to five or six of those um, female larvae, and then five or six of those will hatch out. The one that was um, the most, that was the that was the best will probably hatch out first and she'll immediately go and sting and kill the other the other queens so that she can be the new queen of the hive and possibly um, her mother then will fly away with about half of the hive as a as a um, as a swarm and and try to find a new home okay now so these queens sorry to interrupt you these queens they don't they're a are they asexual then they don't have to have a male to reproduce that's exactly right. They, they have both asexual and sexual reproduction. Now, let's go into the sexual reproduction because you guys have all paid a lot of money and we want to make sure we cover the birds and the bees here in this lecture. Um, if the egg is fertilized, it will become a female and that egg will be a worker or a queen. But if the egg is not fertilized, not fertilized, here comes the asexual part of it. If the egg is not fertilized, it will become a drone, a male bee. Now this is the hard thing to think about, but, but the drones only have one set of chromosomes from their mother, from the queen. So they get all of their genetics from their mother, none from a paternal source. And they only have one set of genes, so they're haploid. And since they're haploid, if there are any mutations in that genetic material that's passed on to them, it will manifest itself. So the drones have a lot of genetic problems. They, they, sometimes they're completely white, sometimes they're black, sometimes they're blind, sometimes they don't have formed legs, sometimes their wings are malformed. Um, so they're haploid and being haploid is not a good way to live. But, uh, but there's, a there's enough of the drones that come out okay that they can um, go out there and um, mate with the queen. Now the queen, um, after she's killed the, her rivals in the hive, okay, after she's killed her rivals in the hive, um, and this has nothing to do with what's going on in the news right now, nothing with the royal family or anything like that. <laughs> well, not necessarily. Some of these things have something to do with that. But anyhow, um, as, as she, after she's killed those her rivals off, she'll take a, a maiden flight and she'll fly more than five miles away. The reason why she wants to fly more than five miles away is because she doesn't want to be bred with anything that's in her own hive that has her own genetics. So she flies out to drone congregation sites. Now drones are extremely good flyers. If you take a look at the drone there, they're very robust as long as they don't have genetic problems. And they have bigger wings, bigger thorax with more muscle and more trachea and everything. And they fly miles and miles and miles out to drone congregation areas where the, 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 the queen will take a, a, a straight line flight. And these drone congregation areas are usually long, tubular, about, oh, 25 feet above the ground, tubular and straight. And she'll fly down that straight tube and, um, and get bred. And she'll take maybe eight or nine of these maiden flights and get, and get um, fertilized by about 20 or 30 different males. And it's important that she gets fertilized by many, many different males. If she only gets fertilized by one or two males, then her progeny or the worker bees later on will only have two different fathers. And they start fighting dramatically. And they won't do the different chores that are in the hive like cleaning or, or cleaning up or feeding the brood or producing um, the, uh, from the mandibular gland, the um, royal jelly, and they'll get to fighting. Whereas if all of these daughters have many, many different fathers, then the hive runs more smoothly and they, um, they don't fight as much about who's gonna do the work, okay? 
but then after the after the drone has has mated, uh, you only need a very few number of drones to mate, and so they fall off after they've mated and pop and fall dead on the ground after that. The queen certainly doesn't; she flies back. But it's very dangerous this mating with the queen because it's rough and she is not a good flyer. And birds and other insects they would love to kill her and eat her on the way back. So. Many, many times they die on their maiden flights. So it's difficult to raise queens. And if you've got a queen that you buy, they're already pre-bred. So they're ready to go. They're ready to go. Okay. Um, so a lot of people said, let's, um, let's um, not have very many drones in the hive. And they do this by um, eliminating drone cells. Drone cells are large cells in the hive. They have to be bigger for those eggs because the drones are going to be bigger. So what they'll do is they'll kill off all of the drone brood and just have hives that are all females because they don't want to waste any, they, they don't want to waste any of their honey or anything feeding those drones. Um, but we have found that if you do that, your hive does not function normally. The worker bees, the females, fight and are upset at each other all the time and it doesn't work very good. You need the so you need the drones to mate and also to calm and keep the hive nice and calm. There should be a whole bunch of questions by now or people should be very upset about some of the things I've said. <laughs> but that's the birds and the bees for you. That's the birds and the bees. Okay. Any questions? Yes, I can you repeat that? You said the the royal jelly was produced from the female workers from the what gland? Mandibular <laughs> gland. From the man yeah, the mandibular gland. Mandibular. Which isn't very important. Just here's the important concept is they're feeding them this food that is extremely nutritious for bees. And it causes a change in how the genetics are expressed. If you ever want to look that up, it's called epigenetics. And even humans have epigenetics. So for instance, this, this little egg that got fed royal jelly, she can become a queen. And if it doesn't get fed royal jelly, it's going to become a worker. And take a look at it. There's a big difference. The hip size, for one thing. Instead of having a stinger, she's got an ovipositor. Um, the queen has no way to clean her antennae off. She also has no way to um, clean pollen off her body and no pollen basket. She has very weak eyesight, okay? But a huge, um, um, kind of a, a, a huge or bigger um, thorax there, uh, but not very strong legs and things. And so that's called epigenetics. She, if, she, if that larvae had not have been fed royal jelly, it would have become something totally differently genetically than the other. Now, humans also have this. And oddly enough, in humans, epigenetics is also tied to our nutrition. Now, these nutritional changes can affect a mother's children, especially her daughters, up to the third generation sometimes. So watch what you eat. And if you ever want to study something really interesting, it's epigenetics. And one of the first ways that we found out about epigenetics is through beekeepers studying bees, okay? Uh, epigenetics, it's really, really cool. Any other questions? We just got a humorous discussion going on here in the chat, Reed, where <laughs> the, the, the women have got to have a man to grouch at or else they start fighting with each other. So, you know. I know, I'm gonna get in trouble for the things I said, but it's true, it's true, um, anyhow. But the other thing on the male side is that the females do not feed them through the winter, okay? So in the fall, at the first frost, they kick out all the, all the drones, okay, all the males. Because let's be honest, they're big and huge, have a lot of muscles, and they, it's, it, it's hard to feed them and keep them fed. They eat a lot more than the, any other animal in the hive. And so they don't allow the, the drones to come back at night. And if they do get in the hive, about 16 of the workers will grab them by their antenna and their legs and drag them out. And so in the fall, that those first frosts, you'll see a bunch of the drones um, hanging out on the, on the um, grass outside the hive, you know, just waiting to die. You know, they're just, what about all the good times we had? But that's the end of that for them. Not gonna feed those guys during the winter, which goes back to a really, really weird question. Since all of the males die during the winter, how do they find the 
the drone congregation sites the next year? That's a good question. And nobody knows the answer because the drone congregation sites that I talked about that the queen flies through, they're in the same area year after year. So if you want to do your PhD and become a hero like Lorenzo Langstroth, Langstroth then you're going to have to study those drone congregation hives because it's just, a, it's just an enigma of nature. We don't really know why, that, why that's the way it is. Okay. Anyhow, their life cycle goes like this. So I think on the left that I can't see it because the way my screen is, is fixed, but I think that's the worker right there. The worker, it takes, um, no, that's the, that's the, sorry, that's the drone. On the left there it are the drones. And if you notice it, the drones take a lot longer to, to grow, up to 24 days for them to go from an egg and hatch out. And isn't that true of nature? Boys always take a lot longer to mature. Anyhow, that's the way it is. they don't hatch out until for a lot longer. The workers, uh, they, I'll have to move this little deal here um, so I can see what I'm talking about. Okay, the workers, they'll hatch out in about 21 to 22 days. So they'll be ready to go and start working. Now, as they go through their life cycle, they'll start out as a housekeeper. Then they'll go into undertaking where they um, chuck out all the dead bees and the sack brood and things like that. Then they start working in the new nursery where they feed the larvae. Then they'll start being a royal attendant where they feed the queen and go through all these different worker stages until they, at the end of their life, okay, the very, very last end part of their life, they become a foraging bee where they actually go out there in the environment to collect honey. And the reason why, why is because you have to have a smart bee and you also have to have a bee that you can sacrifice. So all those foragers are the oldest bees, the smartest bees, but also the bees that are the most arthritic and the bees that have the most disease and the bees that are the least valuable. Now, I'm not saying anything about, because I'm approaching 60 years old, but anyhow, maybe I am getting less valuable, but I certainly am um, smart and a good, and, and would be a good forager. But remember, if you happen to kill a foraging bee, you got to remember that that you may be doing the hive a favor because that bee might be full of disease like like nosema and diarrhea and come back to the hive many times we found out that if if you kill off a forager and even if you kill off a whole bunch of the foragers it makes the hive stronger at times and so when you're out there in the environment and and a forager gets killed by insecticide or pesticide which isn't a good thing i'm not saying it's a good thing but it's way better than having an insecticide go back into the hive and kill off the larvae or the younger workers. Because remember, if you kill off, if you spray and kill off a, a worker bee, that worker bee only had a few days to live probably anyhow. Any questions on that? Okay, I'm not saying you should spray bees and kill them, but you've got to keep this within reason, be reasonably and, and understand what's reasonable about the, about the hives. Okay. Okay. The next thing is the queen. Look at that. 16 days. Can anybody tell me why we'd want to have a situation where we want that queen to become fully mature in just 16 days and why that would happen? I'd say that you want that uh, first one to live to fight each other. Yeah, that's it. And then also, you know, you can't go very long in the season without replenishing that brood. Um, and so the other thing is that queen, she could die on her maiden fight and they'd have to create another queen really fast, right? And they've got to use eggs that the previous queen had fertilized in order to do that second generation of queens, right? And so it's critical that she gets out there and takes that maiden flight and either lives or dies as soon as possible. And the reason why she can complete her life cycle once, a, or, or at least get to the adult stage very quickly is because of that royal jelly. She's ramped up genetically and nutritionally. Now the queen, she can live four or five years. And, you know, Sometimes when I was a kid and when I was beekeeping, I had hives that had queens that were that old. But nowadays, that's not a good idea. With all the different types of diseases and things that we have, we want to replace our queen every year. And in fact, um, I've done two uh, journal papers where I studied the effects of, of putting in new queens and also the effect of hygienic queens 
on Nosema, colony collapse disease disorder and things like that. You can just type in J. Reed Finley and, and Google it. And I think you'll be able to find some of those, some of those um, papers. And so, so anyhow, the queen, out of anything I can teach you tonight, is the most important thing about avoiding colony collapse and death and disorders. And in order to get a lot of honey and have a great hive that you love, it's all about the queen. Having a new well-bred and a queen that's bred with many different drones <coughs> every spring is the most important thing that you can do to become a good beekeeper. Okay, so everybody repeat after me. The most important thing about beekeeping is having a well-bred young queen in the spring. <laughs> okay, and that'll solve many of your issues right there. Oh, there are you have different types. To... oh go ahead. Oh, sorry. Would you, how would you go about replacing a queen? Would well, you take the one out and then put another one in? I mean, won't the other bees reject the new queen? Yeah. So the way you do it, if you're just a beginning beekeeper, is you order a queen. And they can be upwards of 30 bucks. And there's different places on the internet. And usually you order those queens from, from places like Georgia. Georgia is one of the main places, but California is becoming a place for queen rearing. But Georgia is the, one of the main places, right? Anyhow, you get that queen. And you have to usually find the old queen and kill her. So you'll have to find her and kill her. And, and you'll know when you need to have your queen replaced is because there won't be laying very many eggs in the bottom of the cells. And I'll show you pictures of that later. But, and the brood pattern will become very spotty and I'll, I'll show you pictures of that later. But, but anyhow, what you have to do is you have to kill that queen and then you put the queen in a little box that has got um, a screen along it. And then it allows the bees to get used to that queen. Now, it's, it's extremely difficult, actually. Anything you write and anything you read is going gonna, is gonna to make you think that putting in a new queen is very easy. But about 10 to 15% of the time, even with a beekeeper that's been keeping bees for 30 years, a guy that really knows how to keep bees, even then 10 to 15% of the time, the, it, you'll have a failure of reintroducing that queen. Um, because the, the bees, lots of times, they will, they'll swarm around her and mob her, and they'll actually suffocate her or even pull wings and stuff off. And so if you see that happening, you have to blow air onto your queen cage to get the bees off of it the next day so that she can get a breath of air. And um, the CO2 in your air makes the bees walk away, and you'll use your own breath. Now, make sure you have a, mat, a, 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 a net on before you do that, but breathe on them and it'll give her space. Um, if she does get out of the cage, if they release her from the cage, but they're still mobbing her, and you'll notice this because you'll pull out the frame that she's on and there'll be a big glob of bees about the size of a golf ball. What, what you'll do is you'll have to, here's where it gets hard. Usually by that time, a beginning beekeeper is just going to have to give up on it, but, but um, people that have been around bees a lot, you scoop them up with your bare hand, the ball, and then you put a bee box, a queen box in the palm of your hand so that she can climb into that bee box through your fingers and into that box. It's one of these things I probably have, I'd have to show somebody, I'd have to have a video of it. And then once she gets in that box, then you put marshmallow and cap it again and then reintroduce her back in the hive. And by that time, they're getting more and more used to her and it, it can still be a success. And I've had situations where I have had, had to do that three times to make it work. So. I mean, that gets back to this one idea. Beekeeping is not easy as they make it seem in the videos and everything that you look at. Reintroducing a queen is extremely difficult. So anyhow, but don't get scared. It's fun. And, you know, what's the best way of learning? The best way of learning is by having failures, right? And so the great thing about beekeeping is you're going to learn a lot, aka you're going to have some failures, okay? Okay, let, let's get going here. I'm, about, I'm going to talk about bee communication. Um, there's the bee dance. Um, you know, the bee dance isn't as important as they had once thought. Even though the bees do do the dance and orient themselves on the frame to, to give a direction of where the pollen is and where the nectar is, 
um, through recent studies, they found out that the pheromones and the, the scents that the bees give off and also the scent of the flower on the bee itself has a lot more to do with the bees getting out there and um, finding their nectar source. But they do do the dance, they do do the dance, okay? So some of the things that you're gonna need are these. And now these, these numbers are, these prices are about, oh, probably 10 years old. So the prices have gone up quite considerably, but these are the types of things that you will need in order to, in order to start your beekeeping. So what I suggest humbly is that you go to manlake.com and look at their stuff. That's a great place for getting um, a whole kit. I would not buy these things individually by any stretch of the imagination. I would buy a bee starter kit that has all the most important things. You'll get a great price reduction if you do that. And then I would always start with two colonies. I would never go with one colony because if you do have a, have a, a failure with one colony midsummer, you can, you can um, take and, and steal some of the brood and some of the eggs from your strong colony and put the eggs and brood in the other colony and the bees will have a pretty good chance of creating their own queen. Whereas if you just have one colony and they have to requeen themselves, it gets really sketchy after that because they're using really, really old eggs. Whereas if you find out that, that there's no eggs getting laid in your second colony, what you do is you just bring eggs over there and let them create their new, their new queen if they, if they can, okay? So here's what the parts of the hive look like. You, you'll need most of these parts. Um, you can get away with not having an inner cover, but one of the reasons why I like the inner cover in our area is because when it gets cooler nights, condensation will build up on that inner cover. And if you'll tip your hive just a little bit, that condensation will run out the front instead of dripping down on bees during a cool night. And especially in the winter, it's almost, it's very critical in the winter, okay? And most of this stuff will come in your beginning, your beginning hive, okay? So installing the bees. Once you get the bees, um, you order them, you're gonna get a package of bees. Um, might wanna warn the, um, the post office that they're coming, but the post office, believe it or not, gets a few of these every single year. There isn't a post office in the United States that hasn't had to deal with bees in their hive. So it's not gonna be a new thing to them, but they probably would like to have your phone number so they can get you. And you would like to have your phone number because <coughs> at the post office, you'll never be able to go around to the back where the real work gets done, unless you're a beekeeper. And if you are a beekeeper, you will always get to go around to the back. They'll open the back gate for you and you can come and get your bees. <laughs> Reed, we've got a question. Yeah. How much area or land do you need to have to have a hive? Zero, because they're gonna go out five miles from where you're at and rob from everybody around you. So <laughs> you don't need it, you can do it. If, if, the, if you're allowed to have it in your backyard, if, if the ordinance is such that you can have bees in your backyard, um, then you, you know, in the Snake River Plain, there really aren't areas where bees wouldn't thrive. So you don't have to, you don't have to put your bees right next to your alfalfa field. They'll fly five miles to all the surrounding alfalfa fields and things like that. Does that answer the question? I mean, I don't get what you mean. Um, bees are one of these deals where um, if you have like in, like just on the outskirts of Pocatello, I would have out there at Fort Hall, I can have upwards of 40 beehives all right next to each other and they would do just fine. Does that help answer the question? So yeah, I think so. We did just have a question. Someone asked if their neighbor has two hives, can they also have hives? But I think your statement about 40 hives together answers yeah. that pretty well. Yeah, if, you're, if you drive around the countryside, you will see bee Ape, what's called apiaries. And you'll notice in those apiaries, you almost have, you almost always have at least 20 hives, if not 40 hives altogether. Now, remember, you, you are reasonably liable for anything your bees do. So, I mean, one thing I did is I started a, a, a beekeeping LLC, a, a little limited liability corporation. And everything that I, that I bought through the bees, I had a separate checking account and separate insurance just for my bees. 
that's so if somebody got stung or my bees fell off the back of a truck or some crazy wild thing might happen, which will happen. Um, if you keep bees, you are going to have a neighbor that, that um, wants to sue you eventually. Um, even if you're giving them honey, if somebody gets stung by a wasp, you're probably gonna have an upset neighbor. So just be prepared for that. Um, and like I said, I set up my own LLC. In order to be separate from your own finances, you have to have a separate checking account and a separate insurance on that bee company. And it's probably worth it, you know. I mean, it, it costs about $300 to incorporate. You can lose, use LegalZoom.com. Um, me, myself, you know, unless I was didn't own my home and didn't have a good job and didn't have any savings, um, you know, where I could withstand any type of a uh, lawsuit without having anything hurt me because I don't own anything, I, I would definitely try to protect myself a little bit with your little beekeeping organization there. Any questions on that? I don't want to dissuade people from beekeeping, but you've got to be honest with yourself. Everybody's, you're probably going to tell everybody in your neighborhood that you're keeping bees because you're excited about it. And the chances are somebody in the neighborhood is going to get stung by a wasp and they're not going to know the difference. So they're going to blame you. I mean, who wouldn't? So that's kind of the, that's kind of the negative side of that. Um, so when you get your packaged bees, um, that no, when you go to the post office, I'd bring a spritzer of, of sugar water to spray on them. That calms them down and um, don't, don't soak them, but spray them a little bit. And then they'll, that'll calm them down and they'll start eating that sugar and, and, and be pretty good. That night, you ought to put them in a cool, dark place, like downstairs. Then the next day, you go out there and you remove the feeding can and you remove the queen and you put the queen in your, in your front vest pocket to keep her warm so that she doesn't get cold because you're usually installing bees when it's just a little bit too cold for the queen. And then you take your, your hive and take five frames out and then hang your, your queen between two of the frames and then pour the bees over the queen and into that empty space where the five frames were. And then slowly replace the five frames back down into the bees. Don't smash the bees with it. Just push the frame down into the hive until it touches the, the ball of bees. And as it touches the ball of bees, they will climb up onto the frame and you can slowly let it enter into that ball of bees. And then usually what I will do is stuff the entrance with grass and just leave a small space for the bees to go in and out for those first few days. That helps it so that the bees can have a small place to defend and so they don't get robbed out by wasps right off the bat. Okay. But there's some great videos on the internet about um, installing your bees. And I think Jennifer Worlin, who is the, um, the Teton County Extension Educator, she's going to put together a video. I'm going to videotape her installing some bees. And so this next year, she'll have a videotape of installing bees. But there's plenty of YouTube videos on installing bees. Let's wrap up the last couple of minutes on where you should put your apiary. The most important thing that, you'll, that you need to understand is that in Idaho, they need full sun. Do not put your bees in the shade, even though um, there's gonna be many things that you're gonna read on the internet where it tells you to put your bees in the shade. That's not for Idaho. In Idaho, the bees need to be kept out in the sun, as much sun as possible. The more sun and the hotter, the better the bees do. Okay, but also make sure they're away from frost pockets. Make sure they're not in a swamp where it's wet all the time and make sure that they have water. If you don't have water, then they're going to festoon themselves on your neighbor's tap and they are not going to like that. Um, so make sure that you have a source of clean water, not dirty water, clean water, which usually means at my house, I just left the, the leaky tap leaky. And that was plenty. So leaky tap is plenty of water for the bees to use for the most part, especially Reed, if you're only going to have a couple of hives. Yeah, go ahead. We got a question about what time <laughs> of year is best to install your bees? Well, there's only one time of year. There isn't, there isn't such thing as a best time of year. There is only one time of year and that's in the spring. You will be not successful in the summer or the fall. You've got to do it in the spring. And it's about the time when you go on, on online and order your, your um, nucleus colonies or order your packaged bees, they all come 
and they all get sent out within a month of each other. So whenever though, whenever that organization or that website says their packages are ready, that's when you install them. And so there is no such thing as a as the best time of the year. There's only the time of the year. So I'm going to stop giving my presentation. Let's go ahead with just um, for the next few minutes. Just let's just do questions. And I'm going to stop sharing here for a minute. So Reed, when you order queens, it just comes. The queen is the only one that comes, right? You don't get the package. Oh, the package. If you order a package bees or a nucleus colony, they always come with the queen. It'd be really extremely rare to get a package or a nucleus colony without queens. And nucleus colony is just simply an, a colony that has brood with it, no, which is I, great. If you can get a nucleus colony, that's way better because they've got brood already with them. Whereas a package bees is just going to be bees and a queen. So with package bees, you don't get honey usually that first year. Whereas with a nucleus colony, you'll probably get bees that are that are from the same colony. They're used to working together. Um, they've smelled the queen for longer. You'll still have to make sure the queen gets released with that nucleus colony, but you can sometimes get honey that first year. The other way to get hives is with a swarm. And lots of times swarms, if you gather them in the spring, they'll produce honey the first year. But if you, if you gather a swarm after July, they will more than likely die. They won't have enough time to produce brood and honey to survive the winter. I was just talking about getting the, the queen to replace your queen. When okay. you just buy the queen. You can buy the queen separately. She'll come in a box with a bunch of, um, with a bunch of um, food for her in, in the same type of canister, but she will also be totally covered and festooned with worker bees who will be taking care of her, fanning her, keeping her alive on the trip. Okay. So and lots of times if I order a queen, order a couple of them because lots of times you'll have a dead queen on the trip. But that way, you know, instead of spending 30 bucks twice, you're spending 60 bucks once, but then you're more assured of getting a queen. And if both the queens survive, then make two nucleus colonies. Split the colony in half and make two nucleus colonies. Because they could still kill one of the queens and then you'd have to re-put the colonies back together. If you want to put colonies back together, you can. You have to kill one of the queens or one of the queens might be dead. You just put newspaper in between the, the boxes and then put the box on top. And by the time they've eaten out between the newspaper, they're, they're loving each other instead of trying to kill each other usually. But even that can be, you know, it doesn't work about 10, 15% of the time. So any, a lot, any other questions? We have literally, literally scratched the surface, but let's go through just your questions now. I have so many, <laughs> but I guess I'll, I'll ask. I have done it before in Northern New York and the hive that I bought, it wasn't flat at the top. It was um, a, um, gosh, kind of like a triangle shape. Oh, yeah. And does that, is that a better um, top for it? No, you want to go with the flat one? Okay, so they've got these hives that are flat and long, okay? And, oh, what's in the name for them? You'd think I'd know. I haven't actually taught beekeeping for a couple of years, so my brain went dead. Um, oh, they're called... Um, uh, Ron, do you know the name of them? Yeah, if you hadn't asked me, I could have told you. <laughs> yeah, now we both have got a mind block. <laughs> and yeah, they're called frame hives, you know, where, where the frames are, they don't go up like a Langstroth hive, they go horizontal. That is a bad, bad idea because they usually tend to burr comb those things up terribly. They don't keep their heat. Heat goes up and bees like heat, so their heat spread out. And, and they, they don't keep themselves warm. And then also the, the most insidious thing is bees naturally are in a tree trunk. So they naturally like to, to go vertical. They don't like to go horizontal. And so they, they just don't do very well. They don't work hard. They don't like each other. They, they are more rowdy. They're, it's just terrible. Those, um, oh, what's the name? It's, it's called um, frame hives. They're called, um, before the end of the night, it'll come to me. But don't do that. Stick with the Langstroth hive. The other one that I say do not do is those hives that you, uh, what were they called? They, that supposedly automatically extract honey out of them. Have you heard about those, anybody? Yeah, yeah. is that the one where you can see it, see the bees making the honey? Like has kind well, of that's an observation hive, and you can see the bees. But there's these other hives where you you turn a little knob and the honey comes out of a tap in the back. 
Oh well, yes, I I tried that. It didn't work. No, no don't no, do that. Work. Don't do that. It does top, even... top bar hives, read right? top, top bar. Oh, that, okay, the top bar hives are the long ones, and yeah. then these other ones that I'm talking about are these hives where you can they're supposed to be self extracting hives. That doesn't work in Idaho because in Idaho we have cool nights and honey does not flow at any time during the day in any hive in Idaho. So you'll never, for, first of all, you'll never get the honey out of it. Second of all, in Idaho, we have wasps that are extremely aggressive that as soon as there's any type of honey that's flowing in a hive, the wasps know it and they will rob the crap out of your hive. So it's not like the honey won't get harvested. It'll get harvested, but not by you. It'll get harvested by the wasps. And the wasps, instead of just harvesting the honey, they harvest the bees and the brood. They eat everything. So it's all gone. And it, they'll do it in just a few days. And the second thing is, is that's not new technology. They'll say that that's new technology. No, that's old technology that's come around three times and is for the third time been proven very wrong and very bad. And so don't ever do it. And, and it's hard to feed your bees, clean your bees, get a new queen. It's hard to look at brood in those hives. They are just, it's like having a, a, a terrible skep hive. It's got all the worst characteristics of skep hives and none of the good. And like my twin brother, he's been beekeeping as long as I have. And he's got a saying, don't grow a brain, <laughs> which <laughs> I hate that saying because it might be a little bit rude, but my brother's a rude person. I didn't say that. My brother said that, but don't grow a brain because anytime they come up with a new idea, it never works as good as the Langstroth hives. It always comes back around to traditional methods of beekeeping always being, always being the best. Okay. Next question. Uh, Reed, other, we've got the, the other type of hive is called the wari hive. Yeah. Uh, it's one where they just kind of naturally rotate the, the boxes through. And I don't know. I, it's not as good. I don't think it's as good. Yeah. A hive. Buy a Langstroth hive and only buy a Langstroth hive. If you got your bees in other types of hive, get them in a Langstroth hive. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so first of all, in the chat, how much honey will two colonies make? And maybe, maybe you should also say how much can you harvest? That, that depends. <laughs> yeah. So my funny joke is everybody gets into beekeeping because of the honey and everybody gets out of beekeeping because of the honey. Because Yeah, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to extract that honey. Now, it's extremely variable. Even in your own apiary, you'll have one hive that doesn't produce enough honey to even survive the winter. Another hive that produces just enough to survive the winter. They'll need 60 pounds of honey to survive the winter. So you've got to leave 60 pounds of honey in that hive to survive the winter. Then you'll have some that produce a whole, a whole super of honey. And then you'll have another hive somewhere on the end of your row there that will have five supers of honey, you know, hundreds of pounds of honey. And so it's extremely variable, even in your own apiary. And there's no way for me to say, th there is actually no such thing as the amount of honey your hive will produce because the only way to get to an average is to have a bunch of bees. So if you've got a colony of like 40 hives, you can talk about an average for that year. But if you've got two hives, you literally could have two hives that don't produce any honey at all easily, easily have that. Or you could two hives that produce tons. And then, the, but the other thing you gotta remember too is it's very frequent that the hive that produces the most honey one year will be your first hive to die the next year. Don't know why that is all the time, but that's why it is. Lots of times those hives that produce a lot of honey have a ton of bees in them. And the problem is they have a ton of bees in them going into the winter, I feel. And then it's just like a little animal in there. If you have 60,000 bees in that hive during the winter, that's a lot, of, that's a lot of, of respiration and a lot of water through their respiration. And so you'll get a lot more fungi and bacteria that attack them during the winter. So oddly enough, some of those bee colonies that don't have very many bees in them, just the queen and a tight cadre of, of really good workers, they're the ones that survive the winter because it's just like our pioneer ancestors going across the plains, you know? If you had 500 people in a caravan, it's harder to keep that alive than 10 or 15 people. You kill one buffalo, you got those 15 people taken care of. 500 people, uh, you need more than one buffalo to get through the winter. So, um, you know, just because your hive did great one year, it uh, doesn't mean it's going to be the best hive the next year even. 
Okay, next question. If you want to learn more about bees and get hands-on learning, what is the next step? Well, by beekeeping for dummies. Can you see that? I don't know if you can see it. No, we can't. Your background's covering it. Let me turn my background off so you can see it. I'm going to do my, okay, video. We'll go to choose. It also helps if you can find a beekeeper who will just kind of help you. Yeah. Give you some experience and it's better to practice with somebody else's bees as long as you don't mess them up. <laughs> is that right or is that backwards like in the mirror? No, that's right. That's no, right. That looks right. Cool. When there, I'm looking at it, it looks like backwards in the mirror. So there is a big beekeeping club that has a Facebook page and everything in, in the region here. Yeah. Well, the great thing about beekeeping clubs, it's a great place to get to know people and have camaraderie. But if there's 15 people in the beekeeping club, you'll have 15 people telling you the wrong way how to do it. Honestly, I mean, honestly, you, and, and every single one of them knows exactly how to keep bees because they've kept bees for five years and it's all worked out great, right? Um, no, uh, it's my whole opinion is, is stick with beekeeping for dummies. I've read that book inside and out and it is the, you no, know, like I said, don't grow a brain. The great thing about beekeeping for dummies is the guy that wrote it didn't grow a brain and tried to do it on his own. What he went out, he went out to people that know beekeeping and know the traditional successful ways to keep bees. And that's what he wrote about. And so, you know, there, there's going to be a ton of things. In fact, I had a call today. Honestly, one of my beekeepers um, wanted to know where they could get hemp seed, you know, marijuana seed, because they, they found out that bees do so much better on marijuana and hemp. Now, there's no research on that. That just got out there in the, in, in, you know, because, because the legalization of hemp and stuff like that, that kind of just got out there in the environment. Now, bees do really, really spectacularly in our area on sweet clover and then going out there and getting pollen from the rabbit brush. That's what they like and that's what they do really, really well on around here. Not marijuana, but, you know, you'll go to these beekeeper clubs and you'll, you'll get pulled off in so many different directions, your head will be spinning. So my idea is, Ron's got a good idea. Get with somebody, but make sure that guy's been beekeeping for since he was a kid, basically. And then, if anything, that's going to teach you more than anything, is right there, that beekeeping. In my humble opinion, uh, it's the most on-track advice you can get. I was just thinking of the hands-on experience. Yeah, the, the, books are, the books are great, but the hands-on, you need to have some hands-on right. experience as well. Oh, let me say something quickly about disease. We didn't cover diseases. And the reason why I don't feel too bad about that is this. You know, 20 years ago when I was really in my prime of teaching beekeeping classes, I used to start at 600 people or whatever, you know, I would spend gobs of time on diseases, sac brood, foul brood, American foul brood, the difference and, and all these things and no and all this crazy stuff. And it was good because we encountered all those diseases every year. Nowadays, you don't encounter all those diseases. Does anybody have a, can anybody tell me why? What's a guess? Why would you guess that we don't really see foul brood and sac brood and things like that? Why don't we? It's because of governments made it all illegal. No. That's, <laughs> that's a good guess, but not right, Ron. <laughs> well, that's what the beekeepers would have you think. Because there's not enough marijuana for the bees? That's it. <laughs> No, why? They're, why? They're just um, like they're killing that off. There's... They die too soon. You're exactly right. See, like for instance, me, I'm going to probably die of cancer or something like that. Pneumonia is what they say because I had pneumonia like 16 times when I was a kid, and so they thought that, that the last virus was going to kill me off because my lungs are so compromised. But I'm I'm hard to kill. Okay, um, but yeah, um, the reason why we don't see a lot of those other diseases is because the mites kill the bees off way before they would have died before. When I was a kid, we had some hives that literally were 15 years old. I mean, these hives had gone for 15 years, survived for 15 years in, in the winters in Soda Springs, Idaho. Crazy, huh? Nowadays, if you've got a hive that's on its second year, that's an old hive. They almost all get killed off way before they'll ever get things like American brood, foul brood, sac brood. They will get some light amounts of nosoma, which is bee diarrhea, but nothing like you used to see. You, when I was a kid, you'd see some of these older hives that the front was just splattered with manure. Um, you know, and you had to get a new queen in there 
rapidly in order to stop all that nosoma and kill off some of the forager bees in order to get that nosoma down to a manageable level. But nowadays, it's all coming down to just controlling mites. What it, and, and mites are the things that, in my humble opinion, are causing a lot of the iridescent virus, um, the acute Israeli paralysis virus, the nosoma, the new types of nosoma, all that stuff is getting into the hive and all the viruses are getting vectored by these mites. I think mites are the only thing you really need to know and make sure you use a really, some really great mite controls that you saw also can order from Mammal Egg. And that'll take care of a lot of your diseases because you're not going to encounter American foul brood, I don't think, in your in your career. I I don't encounter it anymore in anybody's hive. I, I haven't smelt that smell for for ten years now. Other questions? Yep. Next question: How much time can you expect to spend taking care of the bees? Bees are wild animals. They don't need any care whatsoever. And they'll do they'll do their thing. Okay? So they'll either they can live or die without you. They'll they'll mostly die nowadays because of the mites. They used to be to where you could have even the wild hive. We forgot about one of our hives out there at Ten Mile. We came back a lot later. It was still there running good. I mean, I mean they're wild animals. They're not domesticated. So the great thing about what about li bee livestock is that you don't necessarily have to go feed them. It's always good that you do a little bit to help them out and have water sources but they don't take a lot of management, you know, and you don't have to, you don't have to extract the honey from them. You can leave all the honey for them for the winter um, and just watch them and, and use them for pollinators and be, have fun with them. Um, or you can open them up quite frequently. I, I, I suggest that you um, don't open them more than twice a week, but to tell you the truth, they get very, very used to you. Um, and if you're gonna go into your hive, go in it from behind, and then don't crack open the hive, open it slowly, okay, because it'll be propolized, it'll be glued together. You want to open it slowly so it doesn't pop, and don't dress up in a brown woolly suit because they'll think you're a bear. Honestly, they'll sting the crap out of you, and don't eat a banana before you go out there because banana has the same pheromones as their, as their fight pheromones, right? But you can go out there, and the more you go out there and the less you use gloves because they'll sting the gloves and then that glove will smell like the bad pheromone. But if you go in there with washed hands and go in nice and slowly but deliberately all the time, wear, wear a screen on your face um, and you know, long sleeve white shirt and long sleeved pants and you can go in there quite frequently. They'll, they'll actually get so used to you, most hives, that they'll kind of enjoy your presence and come and crawl up your arms and say, oh, hi, here's the, the guys here again to open up the hive. So. So anywhere from zero hours to, you know, every single day, all the time. That's all the questions from the chat, but I think Fawn had some more questions for you. Okay, go for it. I always have questions. Um, so I, I have had every hive, so I, I have done it for two years and every one of them has failed. So I am yeah. definitely not going to be offering advice on the beekeeping. <laughs> you're doing good. Hey, you're doing good <laughs> because that's what's going to happen very, very frequently. That's the frustration with beekeeping. The great thing about beekeeping is you're going to learn a ton of stuff about insects. And you're also going to learn a lot about despair and failure. In fact, the great a, a great thing is once you've been a beekeeper, uh, uh, not, a, not a professional beekeeper because they have their ways, right? But once you've been a hobby beekeeper for five years, you will never become depressed because you've learned to deal with death. <laughs> but go I'm ahead, Fawn. Sure. Um, so I kept them alive through one summer and I attribute that, I think, to the, um, was it pollen? I ordered some pollen. I think it was pollen. They come in like the long flat things. Anyway, I put it on there and they did really well, but they died in the winter. Mm -hmm. So I have heard, and maybe this is another wives' tale, but is moving them to a space like a greenhouse for the winter a better idea, or no. is just leaving them Bumble out? Bumblebees can find their way out because they're. If you looked at my original bee thing, there's a little a cell light on the top of a of a bee's head, and bumblebees have that too, and even flies have it to certain extents. And it, and it has something to do with their navigation. Bumblebees can navigate out of a um, greenhouse 
Honeybees tend to fly into greenhouses. And then there's something about the radiation and the and the and the probably the the long wave radio the ultra the infrared wave radi radiation that makes them so they cannot cannot find their way out. That's even true of your shop. If you have a bee that flies into your shop and they hit the window, they're never going to get out of your shop. Okay, and so that's extremely. Do not do that. You can do that with with um, certain bees and certain wasps and certain and especially bumblebees. Bumblebees do extremely well in greenhouses, but honeybees keep them completely away from greenhouses. Now, the reason why your hive died, after our discussion tonight, Fawn, what would you think would be the number one reason why they died or the first thing to check? Having listened to me all night. Probably the mites. No. The mites will- Oh, the humidity? No. No, wrong again. <laughs> Tell me out, give me a hint. What was the most important thing I said tonight and, and the thing that's going to be the most valuable to oh, you? Oh, the queen. Yeah. Queen. Yeah. Ah. The queen is everything. So, for instance, if you've got a herd of sheep, you can look at a ewe as being an individual, you know, reproductive unit, right? And you can look at your cow as a reproductive unit, your goat and all that good stuff, right? Okay. Even your ducks, you know, your chickens. Okay. But bees they don't really think of themselves as individuals necessarily. They're, they've got the hive, the hive mentality, the literal hive mentality. If you ever watched the Borg on, on Star Trek, you know, where it's just the hive mentality, it's like that with bees. They, even the individual bees, they don't try to protect themselves. They'll sacrifice themselves at a, at a click of a button. If you're chewing on a banana, they'll sting the crap out of you. And they've just got minutes to live after, or, or maybe days to live after that. But anyhow, um, it's the queen, most likely, and the way that you check for the queen is not by looking at the queen and the way she's acting. You look at, you look at the brood pattern, the brood pattern. Well, maybe this last couple of minutes, I'm going to share screen one more time and show you the brood patterns here. Um, oh, before you show the brood patterns, yeah. Um, what you said the best or the only time is to set them up in the spring. Um, yes. Is that when you change out the queen as well? Is the spring, or do you change out the you queen? You can get queens in the. You can order queens in the fall also. So the queen deal can be done many different times. Any time during the year. Good question. That was a good question. So when you're looking at hive inspection, that top one is it shows you the brood pattern you want. You know, with everything all filled with larvae that's about the same age. The second one shows you a queen that's got problems. This third one is time to requeen. Let me show you. There's what the eggs are supposed to look like in the cells. As you, as you hold this, the, the, the cells up to the light and you get the, the, the light shining down into the bottom of the cell, you've got to aim the sun so the sun is shining down into the cell. You'll see one egg deposited on the bottom of the cell standing straight up on its butt. That means that it's laid by the queen. If you get four or five eggs in there that are laid along the side of the cell, that means they're being laid by workers. Workers can lay eggs and that's a bad thing. Once you get laying workers, then um, the chances of that hive surviving and the chance of you getting a queen that the bees will accept are are one in a, uh, maybe 10 in a hundred, 10% of the time you'll be able, and, and some of my beekeepers say it's almost 0% of saving that hive. So constantly be on the lookout for really, really good eggs in the bottom of those cells. The, the most important thing that it, a new beekeeper can learn to do out of anything is be able to see those eggs in the bottom. And it's one of the main reasons why older beekeepers have a very, very difficult problem keeping up with bees. They just literally can't see those eggs anymore. And it causes, it literally causes a big problem. Um, older beekeepers don't do as good a job at keeping bees. And that is the problem right there. They just can't see the eggs. And besides that, the workers have not been fertilized. Their eggs will always be drones. Yeah, Ron, that's right. They'll all be drones. And, and eventually you'll have a hive of drones, which we all know, because we've all seen frat houses. We all know that ends in disaster, right? Okay. So are the eggs right here that are in the bottom, are they this color? Yeah. 
Okay, so what is the black color? Because I've had hives that were black in color. What does that mean? Oh, well, as the, as the um, comb gets older and older, the, the bees, they don't, one thing they don't do very well is they don't wipe their feet as they go into the hive. And so their feet have a little bit of dust on them. And so the dust gets spread around the hive. That's another thing that you won't see very much because your hive will die before the comb gets black nowadays. But black comb was very, very common when I, when I first started teaching beekeeping. The other thing you gotta realize is you don't want black comb. You wanna replace all of your comb every three years. So sh you should never have any comb in there that's dark colored or black. It should all be replaced every three years. But it is one of the reasons why a lot of people, if when you go to buy your foundation. So Reed, that's why I, I, I answered a question earlier in the chat. That's why those brood boxes still need to be managed, even if you're only using the bees for pollen. Right. It really should still be managed because that cocoon oh, yeah. builds up in that brood comb and uh, you get a lot of disease residual and all that kind of stuff in there. Yeah, going back to that thing where I said you didn't have to take care of them at all, you know, I mean, with those natural hives, those survivor hives out in the forest, they might, they used to might be able to survive, but the chances are really low without managing them. You won't be able to keep them alive. Um, now, one of the reasons why people buy black foundation, and you'll notice when you go to Man Lake, you can either buy cream colored foundation that looks like honey uh, or black's foundation. I always bought black foundation. <coughs> and the reason for that is, <coughs> is that you can see those eggs reflected from the black foundation easier than you can, can from um, wax or cream colored plastic foundation. We're empty nesters, so our workforce left us. So uh, about two years ago, we stopped doing bees because, well, I'd have to, I'd have to, um, you know, get myself some more kids to start doing bees. So maybe the grandkids.